أما بعد فإن أصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All perfect praise is due to Allah the Almighty I testify that none is worthy of worship except Allah and I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final prophet and messenger. May Allah exalt, exalt his mention as well as that of his families and all his companions. We will continue with what we started last time. Last time we concluded uh, with the prohibitions of the state of Ihram or during the state of Ihram and things uh, that would nullify one's uh, or violate rather one's ihram and the thing that would nullify one's had which is intercourse with one's spouse uh, before the first going out of the first state of uh, ihram today uh, we will start from the time a person reaches mecca as we mentioned last time, we have three types of rituals, three types of Hajj, Tamattu', Qiran, and Ifrad. For those who are uh, performing Tamattu' type, Tamattu', we stated that it was the type in which a person uh, proclaims Umrah and then performs the entire Umrah, comes out of the state of Ihram stays out of the state of ihram until the day of hajj he assumes ihram again from mecca and then proclaiming hajj alone and then starts the rituals of hajj from the day uh, of 8 dhul hijjah those who are performing quran or ifrad have two choices they either go to mina directly without performing the arrival tawaf with which they can do the sa'i they're uh, required to do for Hajj uh, or they can go and do the Tawaf of arrival which is called in Arabic Tawaf al-Qudum Tawaf upon arriving into Mecca that is and with that they can perform the Sa'i that is mandatory after Tawaf al-Ifada of Hajj in other words once they have done this when they do ifada during Hajj, they're not required to do Sa'i one more time at that stage. And we stated that Qiran and Ifrad types are exactly identical in the physical actions. The only difference between them is that a person performing Ifrad does not have to slaughter a sacrifice, which is Al Hadi, while a person with Qiran is uh, commanded to do so just like a person with tamattu' has to do so Quran has something in common between it and tamattu' and something in common between it and ifrad the common thing between it and ifrad is that the physical actions are identical the common thing between it and tamattu' is that they both have to slaughter is sacrifice the difference between tamattu' and Quran is that the tamattu' after the umrah is performed one comes out of the state of ihram quran does not just like i said the state of i mean the ritual of ifrad he maintains the state of ihram until he comes out of the state of ihram after having performed certain acts uh, of hajj uh, upon arriving into mecca one should uh, or to the kaaba one should go and try and uh, let me underline this with a lot of lines and very bold and thick and red lines try to kiss the black stone if you can't then again try to touch it with your hand knowing the state of hajj and the crowd of hajj it is near to impossible or rather impossible without having to harm others to reach the black stone it's it's very difficult without harming yourself or others, pushing and shoving and fighting, literally fighting to get to the black stone. So these are the, the stages 
You kiss, you can't, you touch, you can't, you touch it with something and kiss that one thing, a stick or what have you. Like the Prophet ﷺ taught us, if you can't, then just wave at it with your right hand from wherever you're doing the tawaf, be it the ground floor, second floor, on the roof, you just wave at it or point at it with your hand, and that's sufficient. Because you lose your tranquility, you lose the state you're trying to establish in your heart when you're physically engaged and trying to... You, this tranquility in the heart and submissiveness to Allah Azza wa will be lost there. So, one should try and with the crowd it's not possible. So, one points uh, uh, at the black stone and uh, utters in the first round, Bismillah Allahu Akbar, Allahumma imanam bik, wa tasdiqan bi kitabik, wa wafaan bi ahdik, Oh Allah, having, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, oh Allah, having faith in you, believing in your book, and fulfilling your covenant, and following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, have the Kaaba be on your left side, and start circling the Kaaba counterclockwise. Right? Now, Men, again underline this, men uh, are rec uh, recommended to go in the state of idliba. Idliba is to uncover the right shoulder, wrapping the upper garment under the uh, right shoulder and placing it on the left shoulder by which one exposes the right shoulder. And it is uh, recommended for, again, men to do what is called ar-ramal. And Ar-Ramal is to walk very fast with close steps to one another and walk very fast. And I think we've mentioned this last time. Uh, the, the reason behind this Ramal is that when the, uh, the Kuffar saw the believers coming tired, they started saying these people coming from Medina with the famous fever of Medina, they have no energy. They're not going to be able to perform or they have no strength or what have you. So the Prophet ﷺ commanded the companions to uncover so they can show their shoulders and to hasten walking, which is called Ar-Ramal, from the black stone until the Yemenite corner only. And then walk the other, the last uh, fourth of the circle or the block. The reason being, Kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers of Quraysh, were at the opposite end. So the purpose of hastening the, the Ramal was only to show them so they can relax, catch the breath until they reach the black stone and then resume this for the first three rounds or circles and then uh, walk the remaining four. But this part of Yemenite corner to the black stone corner was overruled and one is recommended to hasten and perform ramal in the entire circle of the first three laps or circles. And this is as per the action of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is recommended that one immerses himself into supplication. Humble yourself to Allah Azza wa Jal. Remember the purpose of Hajj. Remember the immense reward that is awaiting those who perform Hajj properly. And that would help you submit yourself and humble yourself to Allah and to your fellow Muslims. And be kind and soft and lenient with them as you circle the Kaaba. Remember, Kaaba is going to be full. More than full. Sometimes, rather a lot of times, you don't walk. You are being carried or forced into certain directions. You just kind of follow the flow. You have no control as crowded as 
uh, Kaaba is. Once one reaches the Yemeni corner, he tries again to touch. If he can't, then there is no waving at it or pointing at it like the black stone, uh, unlike a lot of people mistakenly do. And it is recommended for one to recite the, uh, the saying of Allah, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And then that is from the Yemeni corner until the black stone. And then when you reach the black stone, you raise your hand and say, uh, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, for seven rounds. Once you finish the seventh round, you touch the black corner, uh, the black stone or point at it. And then one heads to the station of Ibrahim or Maqamu Ibrahim. And now we're going we're gonna to be saying what is supposed to be and what reality forces you to do. Okay. Uh, in principle, one is recommended to pray behind that station of Ibrahim, which is that golden uh, thing next to the door or, or facing the, the, the uh, door of Kaaba. Right? Uh, and upon approaching this, as the Prophet ﷺ said, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى uh, Pray at the station of Ibra Ibrahim. Now, if you can't, then anywhere is sufficient. Ground floor, second floor, third floor, the outside courtyards, anything is sufficient for the prayer of these two optional uh, rak'ahs after that. Uh, after that, one is recommended to go and drink a lot of zamzam, and drink and drink and drink to your fill. And then uh, one heads to perform sa'i. Uh, there are two, four types of uh, tawaf, the arrival tawaf, tawaf al-ifada, which is a pillar of uh, hajj, tawaf al-wada'a, the farewell, Tawaf, which is the last thing a pilgrim, a non-Meccan pilgrim does, and optional Tawafs, right? Uh, tawaf al-Qudum, which is the arrival Tawaf for people of Qiran and Ifrad, as we, as we said, can be performed and attached to it will be the Sa'i, and they can consider that to be the Sa'i of, uh, of Hajj. Uh, tawaf al-Ifada, we will come to it uh, when we're mentioning the days of uh, Hajj, op optional tawaf, uh, what is meant by that is one arrived into Mecca for those who will leave early, for example, on the 25th, I believe a lot of people are leaving, and uh, they arrive in Mecca on the 1st of the Hijjah. They do their Umrah for those who are doing Tamatta, right? And then they're in the Haram. They can go and do seven laps and after seven sets of seven. These are all optional tawafs, right? And a tawaf in Kaaba is equivalent to the two greeting rak'ahs in any other masjid. Uh, conditions of tawaf is that one has to be in the state of purity. He has to have all the uh, parts of the body that are uh, mandatory to be covered. Covered. Uh, it has to be seven full rounds. It has to start and end with the black stone. The Kaaba has to be on your left side. Uh, and it has to be outside the borders of the uh, Kaaba. Remember when we said that half a circle uh, fence, which is called Hijr Ismail, that Hijr uh, is part of the structure, original structure of the Kaaba. So going from within it, having the Kaaba on your right and that half a circle uh, wall on your right, uh, actually makes you go inside the structure of the Kaaba so that round is not counted for you. You have to actually go from outside that wall, right? And it has to be successive. The rounds, the seven rounds have to be successive. Now, if one gets tired, gets thirsty, wants to use the uh, drink water, has to use the bathroom, goes outside, then comes back and resumes. Uh, all of these are uh, yeah, things that don't, would not nullify the succession or salat, one of the obligatory salat uh, happened to, uh, yeah, and it became due during one's tawaf, and especially if someone starts tawaf before dhuhr, 
in the crowds that we have in Hajj, one might take three hours, for example, to, to perform tawaf. Four hours, five hours, if they're sisters and tired or weak people or something, might take them four or five hours, so they will pray Dhuhr and pray Asr. And so too many breaks will happen, but that's fine. Ibn Umar, uh, radiallahu anhu, uh, did three rounds in his tawaf, and he sat down resting, and then stood up and started, uh, resumed the, the remaining seven. Uh, recommended acts of uh, tawaf uh, is to face the black stone when you're starting, to be in the state of idduba, which is uncovering the uh, the right shoulder, to do the ramal, which is the hastening of the uh, of the walk, and to touch the Yemeni corner, and to pray the two optional rak'ahs after tawaf behind the station. And it's recommended that one recites after Fatiha in the first rak'ah the chapter Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun and in the second rak'ah Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad Can one ride during tawaf wheelchairs someone pushing you or they have electrical wheelchairs now in, uh, in the Kaaba they have been there for a while but I mean can one ride yes one is uh, allowed to ride as the Prophet ﷺ was writing as he was doing uh, the tawaf. After that, we said we, we go to Zamzam. After Zamzam, we head to a Sa'i. Sa'i starts with a Safa, Mount Safa. And the Prophet ﷺ, upon appro approaching Mount Safa, he said, I start with what Allah started. Meaning in the verse, Allah said, Inna Safa. Well, Marwata min sha'airillah. Safa and Marwa are from the rituals of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he said, I will start from the mount Allah started first with in the verse. So he started with Mount uh, Safa. And Sa'i of Hajj cannot be performed without having uh, performed a tawaf before that. Yani, Sa'i is attached to a tawaf, any type of tawaf, any of the four that we mentioned. One is not allowed to perform Sa'i unless he had performed tawaf before that, right? Now, when, when one reaches Mount Safa or uh, ascends Mount Safa, and it's not a condition for the validity of Sa'i, that one climbs it all. As long as you're within the boundaries of as safa and likewise in the state of uh, in Mount Marwa, as long as you're in the boundaries of that safa, then that's sufficient, right? In, in the ground floor, there are remaining parts of Mount Safa, and, and people think that their sa'i would not be valid until and unless they actually climb up all the way to the top. And you see a lot of them, old or women, are struggling to go up having great difficulty trying to reach there, thinking that it's a condition for validity, which is not true. Any part in that boundaries of, of uh, Safa is sufficient. And then one uh, faces Kaaba and praises Allah Azza wa Jal saying, uh, Alhamdulillah, and then uttering takbir thrice, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and then recite, the following uh, dua La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir La ilaha illallah wahdah wa anjaza wa'dah wa nasara abdah wa hazam al ahzab wahdah Again, three times and then supplicate for anything you want worldly matters and matters of the hereafter anything you desire Anything you want to ask Allah Azza wa Jal, ask it in your dua and prolong your dua. These are times and places that supplications are likely to be responded to and accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. So one is recommended to prolong and insist and repeat and cry to Allah Azza wa Jal. Cry like a baby 
to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah loves to see his slave humbling himself to him, to his might and glory, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves to see the slave exercising and practicing servitude to the ultimate state. So do that. And then after that, one ascends Mount Safa and starts walking normally towards Al Marwa. Now upon reaching the, the first green mark, one starts running. It is described, or the Prophet ﷺ rather was described to have run so fast that his knees were exposed. As fast and hard he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was running. Again, ar-ramal in tawaf and running in sa'i is only for men and not for women. Right? Though one might say the origin of our running in sa'i was that Hajar was the one who was running, looking for water. Yes, but this is ultimate submission to Allah. When the command comes, we don't start wondering and trying to justify if the justification and wisdom wasn't given to us. Then we just submit and say, we hear and we obey. As the companions radiallahu anhum said, وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. So, upon reaching the second green mark, one goes back to walking normally until one reaches Mount Marwa. Again, during uh, the walking between Safa and Marwa and Marwa and Safa, one should busy himself with nothing but mentioning Allah Azza wa Jal, dua, supplicating Allah Azza wa Jal, reciting Quran, which is a form of dhikr, and enjoining good and forbidding evil. For example, one uh, might be walking and sees a brother with his right shoulder in the state of idliba' like it is supposed to be done in tawaf. It is recommended that he goes and advises him and say, Brother, Assalamu Alaikum, this is only recommended during tawaf and not during sa'i. So kindly cover your shoulder again. Right? This is part of uh, mentioning Allah Azza wa Jal, enjoining good and forbidding evil. Upon reaching Mount Marwa, <clears throat> one ascends, does exactly as he did on Mount Safa, and from Safa to Marwa is one lap. And we we're supposed to do seven, right? So Marwa to Safa again, that's two. So doing so, you will start with Safa and conclude the seventh with Marwa. There was one brother who misunderstood the, the instructions of Sa'i. He did 14 laps. Going back and forth, that's one. Back and forth, that's two. Until he did 14 complete laps thinking that this is what Sa'i was, and he was naturally very exhausted at the end of that. طيب. After concluding that uh, seventh lap, for those who are performing Umrah for Tamattu', they need to go and shave or shorten their hair. And I mean the head, not the beard, right? Now, again, what if someone is very close to the time of, of Hajj? He reaches there, say, 
first, second, third, what have you, 28th of Dhul Qida. In other words, there is not enough time for hair to grow back. Well, some said that it's recommended that he shortens for Umrah and then he shaves for Hajj. Some said, no, he can shave and then when it comes time for Hajj, whatever has grown, the razor just passes over the skin and it shaves it and that's considered shaving as well. Whatever the choice is, uh, both are options one can take. <clears throat> Those who are performing Quran or Ifrad and did this tawaf and sa'i as the arrival tawaf and the sa'i of Hajj, they stay in the state of Ihram. That person in Tamattu' after shaving or, or uh, shortening the hair, he goes out of the state of Ihram, puts back his normal clothes, can do everything a person did before the state of Ihram. Those in Quran and Ifrad stay in the state of Ihram until the day of the 8th of the Hijjah, which is called Yawm al They enter Mina and the person of Tamattu' assumes Ihram on that day and enters uh, Mina on the 8th of the Hijjah. Conditions of uh, validity of, of Sa'i is that it has to be after a tawaf, as we said, it has to be seven laps. It has to start with Safa and end with Marwa. And it has to be walking inside the boundaries of Safa and Marwa. Don't go outside and say, I can just walk this distance anywhere close to Mecca, it's too close to Kaaba because it's too crowded there. Uh, and purity, ritual purity for Sa'i is not a condition. In other words, if one loses his wudu whilst performing Sa'i, then he's not commanded to go and renew it. Again, one uh, may ride and may walk in, uh, in Sa'i. Uh, however, uh, it is better that one walks unless he has a need. If he has no need to ride, then it's, it's recommended that he uh, walks. Now, in Mina, on the 8th of the Hijjah, one who's in the state of Ihram, regardless of the type of ritual uh, he was in, he reaches Mina and he stays there until the next morning. So he performs Dhuhr, performs Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr of the ninth. The four Rak'ah prayers are shortened in two, but not combined. You pray Dhuhr two, two Rak'ahs on its time. Asr comes, you pray two Rak'ahs on its time, but it's two Rak'ahs. Likewise for Isha, you pray it on its due time, but only two rakas. One is again recommended and encouraged to busy himself with nothing but dhikr, Quran, supplication, again in order to fulfill and reach the objective of this great, magnificent act of worship one need to stay as far as possible from anything that would reduce the reward or reduce the state of submissiveness and humbleness to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this can only be achieved if one busies himself with worship, any type of worship. Reciting Quran, supplicating Allah, mentioning Allah Azza wa Jal, attending a circle, or a, uh, a study circle, or a lecture, delivering a lecture if he's qualified to do so, and so on and so forth. Shun arguments, shun debates, shun anything that would affect your heart. Always keep in mind. I am here for an objective. The ultimate objective of my Hajj is that Allah accepts it and expiates all my previous sins. By reminding oneself with this objective continuously, it becomes much easier for one 
to shun anything else but worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. On the ninth, after the sun rises, people start heading towards Mount Arafat or the area uh, of Arafat. One is recommended to pray Dhuhr and Asr combined, shortened at the time of Dhuhr in Arafat. Uh, and the reason for that is the achievement of the object objective. See, uh, having fulfilled your obligation of Salah in the beginning of Dhuhr gives you from Dhuhr until sunset, until Maghrib, doing nothing, having nothing to worry about except supplicating Allah Azza wa And that's exactly one, what, what one should be doing, particularly on the day of Arafah. We will mention uh, the virtue of the day of Arafah because actually the day of Arafah is, is is one day that only deprived people do not attend. I, I consider this a great deprivation from Allah Azza wa Jal to the person who does not attend. Because Arafat is just an overwhelming place and time. Uh, it is enough It is enough for the slave to know that Allah Azza wa Jal descends on the day of Arafah and addresses the angels saying, look at my slaves. They came to me from every distant place, what do they want? They seek my forgiveness and hope for my reward. I make you witness, O oh my angels, that I have forgiven all of them. Proceed to Muzdarifa. Have in all your sins. Forgiven and the sins for those you supplicated for. So, if one knows that this is the, uh, the time and place during which and in which such a precious jewel is being distributed, he would really feel deprived not being there. Starting, the starting time of uh, the presence or being present in, in the area of Arafat uh, is from the time of uh, Dhuhr until the sun rises on the next day for those who come late. Some people might arrive late and don't catch any part of the day, but they come say 10 o'clock at night, after midnight, before Fajr of the 10th. Right? All of that is considered for them as having stayed within the area or premises of uh, Arafat. The Prophet وسلم, encouraged people to do as he did and informed them that the rituals of Hajj 
our traditions and heritage of their father Ibrahim. He said, adhere to the traditions and rituals of Hajj, for these have come down to you from your forefather Ibrahim, meaning Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. For those who are not performing Hajj, it is recommended that they fast the day of Arafah. And for those uh, who are performing Hajj, it is recommended for them not to fast the day of Arafah so as to have strength and energy to perform the rituals of Hajj sound and strong. After the sun sets, one starts proceeding towards Muzdalifa. Upon arriving into Muzdalifa, uh, one should perform Maghrib and Isha combined and Isha shortened into two rak'ahs, right? And then rest. No staying up late for any reason. Rest so you can continue the remaining parts of the Hajj with energy and strength. And to do or perform your Hajj with accordance to the performance of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's performance. One may stay in any part of Muzdalifa except Wadi Muhassar, it's an area between Muzdalifa and Mina. Uh, one is not to uh, stay there. After one prays Fajr on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, so now we've reached the 10th, which is the day of Eid. The first day of Eid. On the 10th, one performs the Fajr prayer, and supplicates Allah and then until very close to sunrise. And before sunrise, immediately before, sun, before sunrise, one, one is to proceed towards Mina again to do the acts of worship of the day of an nahr which is the day of Eid, the day of Nahr, meaning the day of slaughtering. The, the uh, recommended sequence of the actions is as follows. One should start with throwing the seven pebbles of the largest pillar, which is the closest uh, pillar towards Mecca, end of Mina. Then slaughter his sacrifice if he's mutamatta or qarin, any of these two. Then shaves or shortens, and shaving is much more rewarding than uh, uh, shortening or cutting the hair. And then proceeds to Mecca to perform tawaf al ifada. Now, if one flips this sequence in any other sequence, then there is no harm, none whatsoever at all. This is only a recommended sequence. As for those who are old people, weak people, ill people, who cannot be part of the crowd, whether it is in throwing the, the jamarat or in doing tawaf, then the Prophet wasallam gave permission for such people and those with them to proceed from Muzdalifa after the middle of the night. And the middle of the night, Islamically, is not 12 midnight. It is the middle point between sunrise and sunset. Uh, rather, sunset and sunrise. So if it's 11 hours, for example, 10 hours between these two prayers, so five hours after is when midnight is, one can start leaving Muzdalifa after that point of midnight, Islamic midnight, quote-unquote, uh, he can proceed to do any of the actions we just uh, mentioned. Now, 
As we said last time, if one throws the pebbles, slaughters, if he has to slaughter, and cuts or shaves his hair, then he has gone out of the first stage of ihram. After which he can do anything he wants, except intercourse with one's spouse. After performing tawaf al-ifadah, one goes out of the state of ihram completely and is allowed to do anything he, can, he used to do before assuming the state of ihram. Tawaf al-ifadah is one of the pillars of hajj, without which hajj is invalid, just like uh, the staying of uh, Arafah and in Muzdalifah. The number of pebbles, as we said, for the first day, the 10th, the day of Eid, is only seven pebbles. pebbles. What if someone is sick, uh, is weak, he cannot go uh, in the crowd and throw the pebbles? Well, he can authorize someone else to go and throw on his behalf. So that person throws his seven uh, pebbles and then he throws with the intention of throwing on behalf of that he or she who told him to do so. We finish the tenth, right? We have remaining ayyamu tashriq, the remaining days of Eid. They're the eleventh and the twelfth and possible the thirteenth. I say possible because Allah Azza wa gave us permission either to do these two or to add the thirteenth to them. And any of the two choices is valid for Hajj to be completed. Uh, throwing the pebbles on these days is not a pillar. It's an obligation, meaning if one leaves out, he can compensate for it by slaughtering. The pillars of Hajj, one cannot compensate for not doing. If they're not done, any of them, the Hajj is invalid. It's void. But the obligations of Hajj, such as spending the nights in Mina and throwing the pebbles on the days, the days of the Tashriq 11, 12, and 13, these are obligations that can be compensated for uh, by slaughtering uh, an animal if one did not do. On the 11th, 12th, and 13th, for those who decide to stay until the 13th, one should throw the uh, Pebbles, three times, three pillars, that is, seven, 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 starting with the farthest from Mecca, which is called the smallest, which is the smallest, uh, Al-Jamrat Al-Sughra, uh, with seven, and then the middle one, another seven, and it's recommended after the first and the second, which is the smaller and the middle, uh, that one steps aside and supplicates Allah Azza wa Jal. Notice, that almost in every state you're in, in every place you go during Hajj, one is encouraged and recommended to supplicate. It's a reminder, O oh people, you're here for an objective, so work on achieving it. And achieving that acceptance from Allah Azza wa Jal Forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal takes persistence in supplication, in humbling oneself, submitting oneself with submissiveness to Allah Azza wa Jal. Showing our need, our weakness to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. After throwing the first and the second, one goes to the third and it's not recommended to supplicate after that uh, third pillar or the seven the seven pebbles of the last uh, pillar this is the only action one does during the days of tashriq throwing the pebbles for those who have done of course their tawaf in the first day those who delayed and it's uh, permissible to delay tawaf al ifada those who delay tawaf al ifada can perform it on the 11th, the 12th, 13th. If they're staying a month after uh, Hajj, they can delay it later. But for those who have done everything, the only action they need to do or their uh, uh, 
required to do for Hajj or from the Hajj actions is the throwing of the, of the pebbles of these three pillars and busy yourself with supplication, recitation of Quran, mentioning Allah Azza wa Some people uh, cannot spend the night or stay rather in Mina all the time. Well, it's permissible for one to stay most of the night if he cannot be there all the time. Meaning, more than half of the night. So if the night was, say, 10 hours, and he stays 5 hours and few minutes after that, Shaykh Al-Uthaymeen said, anything after this, the, the, the even half, stay in it, any, in any portion of the night after that, would suffice for a person to have spent more than half of uh, the night, which means most of the night. One can leave uh, after the 12th. Now, if someone decides that he doesn't want to stay until the 13th, he must leave before the sun sets on the 12th. If the sun sets and he is still in Mina, he, should, he must stay in Mina or else he has to slaughter. As we said, spending the nights in Mina is an obligation that can be compensated for with the slaughtering. So if he decides to leave, he doesn't want to stay until the 13th. He has that choice. There is no harm. But if he doesn't leave until the sun sets, then he must stay or else slaughter. Now what if one proceeds, he's leaving Mina, but stuck with traffic, which can very possibly happen during the season of Hajj. Well, then he can continue and leave and there will be no harm on him, inshallah, because he has, he had proceeded in the action of departure and not willingly delayed it until the sun uh, sets. Okay, with this we conclude the rituals of Hajj and the only thing remaining after that is the farewell tawaf. There is no such thing as farewell tawaf. Uh, it's, it's a technical term the scholars gave to describe the tawaf. In other words, it's not... In other words, any tawaf that you do before departing Mecca suffices you. I will give you a, an example to clarify. There are two rak'ahs that we are instructed to perform upon entering the mosque. Sahih? Correct? Right. Now, any two rak'ahs suffice, but they're called tahiyyatul masjid. Right? So any two rak'ahs you perform, you have greeted the masjid. Likewise, tawaf. Any tawaf you perform would suffice for tawaf al-wada' the farewell tawaf so that's why if someone delays his tawaf al-ifada to the very end to be the last thing he does before departing then that would act up as tawaf al-wada' the farewell tawaf in other words it's not a, an entity on its own it's just a recommended it's just an act that the Prophet ﷺ recommended us to do and it's a controversial issue whether or not it's an obligation, meaning if one leaves it out, he has to compensate or not. The predominant opinion is that if one does not do it, then there is no harm on him. Right? So if one delays tawaf al-ifada and does that and does sa'i of hajj, and then leaves, then he has actually done tawaf al wada. I hope this point is clear. I mean to say tawaf al wada is not an entity on its own, but the Prophet ﷺ was telling us that you should make the last thing you do in Mecca this tawaf. Tawaf, not this tawaf. Let me take the word this. Right? Tawaf should be the last thing you do before departing Mecca. 
So if one has done tawaf al ifada, then he does an extra tawaf. And that's where people connected that extra tawaf with it being on its own, a thing on its own. And if I did not perform tawaf al ifada, then I should do 14 laps instead of 7. Because I must do two things. You understand? Okay. Tawaf al wada' or tawaf should be the last thing one does before departing Mecca. Now, people go to, to uh, Hajj with groups. You perform tawaf and the crowds are undescribable, right? You do tawaf and you go back to the hotel, to the building you're in or what have you, whatever the accommodation setup is, and you go and take a shower, get packed, wait for the bus, and this might take four, five, six, seven hours. That's fine. That's fine. Right? You want to grab something on the way out? That's fine. But don't go shopping. All right? Don't say, okay, call your wife on the mobile, honey. After we finish tawaf, inshallah, we're going to the uh, towers in front of the Kaaba because they have very, very nice things. We'll do our shopping for the kids and the family and all that. We'll buy all the gifts. It's only going to take three, four hours and we go back to it and get ready. And leave. No, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. You want to go shopping? Do it another time, before, way before. If you, because the scholars say if he intentionally does something and separates the departure from the tawaf, he has to redo. And you, you, you trust me, brothers and sisters, you don't want to redo in that crowd. You don't want to redo. It's very tiring. Right? Then the last thing, again, one does is tawaf. And then returning back to one's uh, hometown, wherever that is. Upon assuming the state of ihram, or ra rather uh, upon proclaiming the type of ritual one wants to perform. Uh, it is permissible for those who fear that something might happen that would prevent them from the completion of the Hajj rituals. Then they can condition their Hajj. One is sick, one is a lady is pregnant, for example, and she feels, she fears something might happen, whatever the reason is, right? Then one can condition uh, the, the, uh, his hajj in the beginning when he's proclaiming the type of hajj. Labbaik Allahumma, say hajjal, for example, for those who are doing ifrad, and then one may say, and if anything hinders me from completing my rituals, then I go out of the state of ihram and the performance of hajj at that point. In other words, you don't have to expiate, compensate, and you don't acquire a sin. Because otherwise, if you interrupt your hajj and not complete it, first of all, you're sinning. And that enough, that's enough on its own. One of, one of the scholars, uh, I was narrating a story uh, to him on a pilgrim who came asking about an action he's done uh, during Hajj. He said, Sheikh, uh, I've done this, this and that. Should I slaughter? The answer was, no, you don't have to slaughter, but you've acquired a sin. The man's reply to that was, Alhamdulillah. He said, Alhamdulillah. He said, Alhamdulillah, because he doesn't have to slaughter. When I said this to the, to the scholar, his face expressions changed. And his face color changed. He said, people don't understand. What is the meaning of sinning? He said, this is equivalent to the wrath of Allah. And the wrath of Allah and sinning make a person deserving of the punishment. 
of Allah the Almighty. And if they try and think and weigh the two issues of slaughtering and compensating, as opposed to being deserving of the punishment of Allah, they would never, never utter the word Alhamdulillah. So conditioning one's Hajj uh, protects a person from this and uh, permits him to interrupt his Hajj without having uh, acquired any sin. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enable us to go to Hajj every year and to Umrah multiples of times every year. Allahumma ameen. And to accept it from us and after the Adhan, the, the uh, field will be open for uh, questions and answers. So the brother can call the Adhan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shalwa la ilaha.